So yeah, so uh, obviously t the topic of tonight's uh, uh, talk is performance-based design of fires, and really this is distilla distillation of probably 15 to 16 years experience trying to apply structural fire engineering techniques to some of the structures which WSP have been involved in. So in, in terms of the, 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 the way the lecture is going to go, I'll give a brief introduction, and then I'm going to talk about real structural behaviour in fire. So this is not assumed stru uh, structural behaviour. Um, but how structures actually behave in fire. I'll then just sort of distill that down into some kind of fundamental theory and then talk about design approaches and specifically performance-based design approaches and how we can apply them. And then I'll just wrap up with just uh, a couple of case studies just to show you how you can apply such techniques to the performance of structures in fire. Just a quick word in case people don't know WSPR. Obviously, WSP is one of the world's largest uh, consultancies. Uh, it's a pure engineering consultancy. It doesn't get involved in construction or contracting. It's, it's pure uh, engineering consultancy. And at the moment, I mean, this slide is even out of date. I can't keep up. There's 48,000 people now worldwide. Uh, and we're obviously all over the world. In the UK, we employ over 8,000 employees um, all over the country. And in, in terms of the, the coverage, uh, obviously the transport and infrastructure business and the property and buildings business are the largest components of the revenue which is generated by that business in the UK. Uh, and I'm part of the property and buildings business based here in London. So to get on tonight's uh, t topic, um, in, in terms of the way that fires actually develop, it's, it's, it's important just to understand how, you know, how, how, that, how, how that actually happens. And most fires will start small. So a small local fire in a waste basket or, or electrical fault. Uh, and, but if it's left unchecked, it, uh, it can have the propensity to actually grow in terms of temperature uh, as time develops. So there's a growth phase associated uh, with fire performance. Now, the way that the a fire would proceed would be that that local fire would start to feed a hot gas layer at the top of any compartment. And that actually acts like some kind of un upside down reservoir. And that hot gas layer, if it's continued to get fed, gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Uh, and when it reaches a point where the radiation in that hot gas layer spreads to a, 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 an area where it can actually combust all the consumables within a compartment, you get a phase which is called flashover. And what that's characterized by is quite a rapid increase in temperature of the whole atmosphere and also because you're engulfing more and more combustibles within the fire a sort of runaway uh, stage develops where the temperature increases quite rapidly and typically it, the temperature would increase from sort of 500 600 degrees c to an excess of a thousand degrees c in the atmosphere and after that flashover period has actually uh, taken place, what, we, what happens then is the fire gets into some kind of steady state um, equilibrium where the fire loading, the ventilation conditions which are driving the fire and the lo heat losses due to thermal inertia and back out to the atmosphere come into e equilibrium and the temperature would, would sort of flatten off. And the maximum temperature you would probably get in a, in a normal building fire would be in the region of 1100 to 1200 degrees C. And then, and then what happens is, once the consumables in the compart compartment are actually burnt, the fire then starts to decay. So you get a decay phase where the fire then starts to rapidly cool down because there's nothing left to burn within the compartment. So this is the way that real fires tend to behave. And the reason why I introduce this is because in terms of fire engineering as a, as a whole, there's a number of measures that can be put into place to make sure that a building is safe in fire. And a lot of them are not to do with structural fire protection. So, for example, if we're going to detect a fire, you're best detecting a fire while it's quite small. So it can be put out either manually or, or by a person or a fire extinguisher, etc. Obviously, if a fire is then left to get a bit bigger and it could set off, say, a sprinkler system, we have a suppression system, a suppression system can actually control a fire. A suppression system won't always put the fire out, but it can control the fire growth. So it, it forms an important part of any fire strategy for any type, type of building. The thing that actually kills people in buildings tends to be smoke and toxic gases. So obviously the control of smoke and toxic gases, again, is another important element of any fire strategy for the building, uh, particularly 
for escape routes because what we need to do is give people safe escape routes to actually get out of the building. So smoke control and escape routes are quite important uh, mitigation measures for, for getting people out of buildings in fire. Another important strategy is compartmentation. And, and obviously the importance of compartmentation is we want to confine the fire to the seat of where the fire actually starts. So by putting fire resisting construction uh, and splitting a building up into compartments is an effective strategy sometimes in confining fire to a small part of an actual structure so it doesn't actually get out of hand. And then last but not least, uh, structural fire protection is either something that's inherent to the particular structural form or something we apply, if it's say a steel frame building, to actually ensure that the structure has sufficient fire resistance to withstand a severe fire. And, and the important thing about that is that really structural fire protection is really the last form of defense in any fire strategy because you have had to had a systemic failure of the overall fire strategy to actually get a severe fire in the first place. So obviously it's far better to do things at the front end to stop a severe fire starting than it is to actually deal with the severe fire once it's actually in place. So that's just an, an important point to make in terms of the way stru where structural fire engineering fits in in the overall fire strategy. So now on to real structures in fire. Um, uh, and this is a fire that took place in the early 90s uh, at a building not far from here at Broadgate. Um, and that was a 14-storey steel-framed office block, uh, traditional composite construction. Um, and this, at this time, intumescent paint uh, or off-site intumescent was not a, a very common fire protection material. And most steel frames were actually put up and then steel protection was applied afterwards. And this was during a, a fire during the construction stage of this, this building. And obviously what you got, got was a very severe fire. So forensically we can go in and we can look at the steel, we can see what colour it's got to, we can look at its metallurgy, and we can understand what sort of temperature that steel would have got to, and therefore understand what kind of severe fire would actually ensue. But the surprising thing about uh, this steel frame was that although it was un totally unprotected, it didn't collapse in fire, which sort of pointed to the fact that there were probably alternative structural mechanisms in play at the fire limit state, which perhaps we could take advantage of uh, uh, when we come into designing steel frame buildings for fire. So th this got the steel industry thinking, and they actually then started to embark on a research program uh, to actually try and understand a bit more about how steel frame buildings would behave in fire. And, and that research could be, can really be split into two, two different areas. One is about fire development. In, in other words, how hot do actually fires get and how, what would be their propensity to affect steel buildings. And there's a whole series of compartmentation tests, com, uh, compartment fire development tests, which took place at BRE. This is a view of one of the compartments. So various compartments of different sizes with different fire load and those timber cribs there are the fire load uh, which is there and the reason why it's timber cribs is because it's obviously uh, measurable so we know how much fire load is there and it's very consistent um, and then we uh, forming different steel elements within there this, this is obviously less fire load than the fire load of the one previously and then setting fire to those compartments to try and understand a bit more about our atmosphere temperature development um, um, within those compartments and th this type of testing wasn't just undertaken in the, in the UK, it was taken, undertaken across the whole of Europe. And a lot of the work that was done in, in, this, in this was actually resulted in what is now called the parametric time temperature curve, which is in uh, Eurocode uh, 1.2, one, one, one which is the structural fire engineering uh, Eurocode. So a whole series of tests uh, were taking place. And here is just a view of... Um, the type of atmosphere temperature curves you would get in, in that kind of testing, where you can clearly see a severe uh, flashover phase, the steady state phase, and then the decay phase. Oh, sorry. And, then, and just for comparison, I'm putting the standard fire resistance curve there, which caught, um, bit, and then I'll come on to talk a bit more about the standard fire resistant testing curve later, just for comparison. <coughs> the other element of the actual research was actually structural response. Um, so an opportunity came up uh, when the BRE constructed um, some full-size buildings uh, in the full-scale testing facility at Carnington. Um, and I was involved in some of the testing on the, 
uh, composite steel frame building, which was a commercially designed and constructed uh, steel framework. They also did a concrete building and a timber building as part of this research series. Uh, so the opportunity came to actually undertake some fire testing on, on this steel frame to actually try and understand a bit more about the restraint conditions and the actual conditions that of, uh, our steel frame would behave in fire. So this, this is just a view of some of the tests. These are the tests that were undertaken by British Steel, as it was then. It eventually became Chorus and then Tata. And uh, there was also further tests undertaken by BRE themselves and also an, another test. So there were seven tests in all carried out on this steel frame uh, composite building. Uh, and the British Steel test concentrated on just a single element and to look, try and look at the degree of restraint and how a single element would behave within a real, real structural frame. A plain frame test across the building, both of those were gas-fired, and the reason they were gas-fired because it was more controllable in terms of the temperature development that you could achieve within those compartments. Uh, and, and the final tests were more 3D in nature, a, cor a corner test, and then finally a demonstration test uh, where we put some real fire loading into those compartments to understand how those buildings behaved in uh, at fire. And the important thing to know about this was that all the beam elements within those compartments were completely unprotected. So we were looking at how an unprotected composite steel beam would, uh, sorry, a frame would actually behave under realistic fires. So just to give you a view of um, one of those tests, and it's a demonstration test. I knew this would cause a problem. So, so this is a view of the demonstration test, which was one, one of the final tests and the biggest test compartment. Um, and what, 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 what this test was trying to demonstrate was um, how it would behave with real fire loading, which was more commensurate with um, the actual. So, so all the pieces of furniture that are in that compartment were all taken apart. They were weighed. They were, the calorific content was actually determined so we could get a realistic estimate of the actual fire loading that would actually be there. It is quite difficult to start fires. So obviously what you see there is like timber cribs, which are there to actually initiate a severe fire. Because without them, you couldn't just put start a fire and that, 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 that fire loading would actually uh, uh, take place. You would probably not get a fire at all. So, so this is in the early phases of the fire. So this is still in the growth phase. So you can see now that most of the timber cribs are actually on fire. They were all connected by... Uh, paraffin salt uh, strips of wood to make sure the fire spread from one crib to the other. Uh, and obviously what you're getting now is this is the phase where the atmosphere temperature at the top of the compartment is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So we haven't reached this flashover phase yet, which we, I described in the, uh, in the early slide. Like that. So the, the fire is still developing. O obviously the steelwork now is starting to get hot, particularly as it's unprotected. So an unprotected steel member could expect to follow very, very much the atmosphere temperature. Um, it doesn't lag that far behind it. So again, we still haven't got flash oil yet. You still see the windows are intact. And the ventilation conditions for this fire were calculated using the parametric time temperature curve to make sure that we could actually try and predict the fire before when we actually designed this actual test. So you see uh, the flames coming out now. So now you can see that we have flash oil on the left-hand side. So the whole compartment is actually on fire. Uh, obviously, the glazing is now uh, breaking. The ventilation conditions are, tri are changing. And obviously, there's sufficient oxygen coming in and out of that compartment to drive that fire to a higher temperature. And the, the maximum temperature achieved in this fire was over 1,200 degrees C in terms of atmospheric temperature. We did have a lot of plastic in there as well to try and replicate more modern fire loading. So now this is the decay phase, and you can see, so, that, so the peak temperature has actually been achieved in the atmosphere, and here we can now first see some of the view of how the steel work, steel work has actually deflected. So the deflections that you're getting in, in that actual fire test are the order of 600 uh, uh, millimetres, which over a six metre span beam is, is like up near to span over 10 light here. Yeah? So obviously, this steel work here is, is at a maximum temperature of 1100 degrees C. And obviously, at 1100 degrees C, it's got virtually zero strength and stiffness. So the thing that's actually keeping those steel beams there 
tends to be tensile membrane action in, in the composite slab itself. This is a view of the compartment the next day, just to give you a, a view of the damage. So, there was, again, there was no collapse in this. Columns were protected full height, and, and it's very important, and the, and the treatment of columns is something I will come on to later. So I just thought it would just be in interesting just to give you a view of uh, a real fire test and how fires can actually affect structures. So in terms of summary, the deflections we're getting in here are obviously far greater than you would expect in terms of normal structural performance. So we had these fire tests, and we had, in some tests, over 600 channels of data, deflections, rotations, and then obviously temperature uh, readings and strain gauge readings on protected elements in particular, uh, so we could actually understand how the structure would react. So obviously now what we're going to do is try and turn that into some kind of fundamental theory so we can actually use that to actually design steel structures uh, in fire. And, and basically two kinds of strain govern. And the first one is thermal strain, which is related to the, thermal, the coefficient of the thermal expansion and the rising temperature. And then obviously in terms of the performance of the structure itself, we're more interested in mechanical strain in terms of where we are on the stress strain curve uh, for, for, for that ma particular material. The deflected shape is governed by total strain, and it's important to realise that the actual thermal strain is the biggest component uh, within that equation. So the biggest contributor to the deflection you will see in that fire, those 600 mil deflections, is really thermal straining of the slabs and the, sh and the steel beams. But the forces that are in those beams are governed by mechanical straining. So after, we have to find some way of extracting the uh, thermal strain from the total strains actually seen. So just to give a, a couple of fundamental concepts, if, if we have, a, say, an unrestrained beam of a certain length and we apply a uniform temperature rise to that beam and it's unrestrained, then obviously that, that beam is going to expand by a certain level of thermal strain, which we know what it is. It's just a co coefficient of thermal expansion times a rise in temperature. The mechanical strain in an unrestrained beam is obviously zero. Uh, if we now restrain that beam, so we stop it from expanding and apply the same temperature rise, then obviously all that thermal straining is converted into mechanical straining. And this now allows us to calculate the force that is in that actual element. And obviously that force uh, in, for this is actually compressive. So we get large compression forces on the heating of, of, of particular uh, elements. So in terms of temperature gradients, you know, we take the same beam unrestrained and we apply a thermal gradient across it, a pure thermal gradient. Remember, it's the theoretical construct. That beam will then tend to pull in. And we can calculate what that pulling in is in terms of... Uh, the thermal the curvature uh, of the beam under that thermal gradient. If we now restrain that beam, and we, again we, we convert the, the thermal strain into mechanical straining, what you actually get is a large tensile force in the actual beam. And really the performance of structures in fire can be sort of understood by just understanding these fairly simple uh, theoretical constructs. So obviously, what's the implications of the fundamental theory for real structures in fire? Obviously, real behavior will have a, a more erratic thermal regime applied to it in terms of temperature rise and gradient. And obviously, the restraint conditions in a real structural frame are dependent upon the stiffness of the surrounding structural fr frame. If we, if we understand that the material uh, properties um, of the structural frame are changing because as it rises in temperature we get a degradation in stiffness and strength. You can see that the, to, to determine the stress state in, in any time it cannot be done just from the display shape alone. It, it needs to be done yeah, using a structural fire engineering approach. So actual restraint conditions change so all things are changing during the performance of that fire. So obviously this behaviour is quite complex to capture particularly in any simple design rules, uh, which was the aim of the steel industry when they embarked on the research. Um, 
So if you just hold the fundamental theory there for a section. Now, now I really just want to talk about the regulations and the design approaches which are available for designing uh, buildings in fire. And, and as far as structural performance is concerned, it, it's functional requirement uh, B3, which is the most important part of the building regulations uh, in terms of what we need to, com to, to conform to. And, and what that actual functional requirement says, it's split into four parts. What it says is that the, the building, uh, overall stability for the building must be main maintained for a reasonable period. It doesn't define what a reasonable period is. Most people take that to be the time it takes for people to, who escape from the building and for the firefighters to actually access that building to fight the fire as there being a reasonable period. But it's not really defined anywhere. Um, there's the spread of fire between buildings, which is really part of the Part of Wall Act, which is a very ancient part of the building regulations. Uh, maybe not so important for modern uh, commercial offices and residential forms where we have standalone buildings. The, th the third uh, part of it is to inhibit the spread of fire, and, and it, it suggests two ways of actually doing that. Compartmentation, so maintain it, the fire to the compartment of origin, and the provision of sprinklers. Uh, and by the provision of sprinklers, what, it, what it's trying to do is try, trying to take rec recognise that the, the probability of a severe fire is a lot smaller in a sprinklered building than it is in an un unsprinklered building. So what that, re what that actually relates to is a reduction in fire resistant ratings for a particular building that has sprinklers provided. So, th so that is like a, the first introduction of a concept of trade-offs, if you like, between different fire protection measures uh, within buildings. And then the last one is to inhibit the unseen spread of fire. And this is mainly to do with uh, hidden voids in cavities, in buildings, both internally and obviously externally uh, in things like... Uh, uh, external uh, wall systems. So, so those are the four um, principles. And obviously, for most modern buildings, the first, third, and fourth are the most important. So in terms of the functional requirements, it's the functional requirements that are the most important part. And obviously, what the government does, it produces in the UK, it, it produces a series of documents which show how you can meet the functional requirements of the building regulations. Uh, and the one for fire is, is, is the approved document B, uh, and what that does in terms of structural performance is it defines the fire resistance rating a structure should achieve. And the, the three things which actually govern it are, are height. So basically, the higher we go, the higher fire resistance rating we need. Um, and occupancy, in that uh, higher, some occupancies have higher fire loading than other occupancies. Uh, and also recognises the difficulty of firefighting as we get taller. And, and what that leads to is a requirement to just fire protect every structural element in that building to a certain level of fire resistance, say 120 minutes if it's a building over 30 metres. But what it also does in the approved document, it, it also talks about alternative ways of demonstrating compliance with those functional requirements. And this is really the performance-based fire engineering approach where we're actually going to look at the actual conditions of the building and demonstrate how that building will actually behave in a fire with a certain fire protection system to show uh, it achieves satisfactory performance that can meet those functional requirements of the building regulations. So those are the two alternative approaches that can be taken to structural fire safety. Just want to introduce uh, what is an important concept in terms of fire safety, and this is the, the standard fire resistance test. Uh, this, this, the curve which generates this test has been around since the early part of the 20th century, so the early 1900s. Uh, and, and what it is, it's, it's a curve which is supposed to represent the flashover phase of a severe fire. Uh, but the only difference about the standard curve is that it just keeps going up and up and up in ad infinitum. And it's, it's not really supposed to represent a real fire, but it's a, a, a standard uh, fire-resistant testing regime which we can actually use to compare the performance of different fire protection products. Uh, and, and, and the way that most fire protection products are, are derived is by submitting uh, beams, columns, walls to uh, a, a heating regime within a standard testing furnace um, to, to generate what their fire resistance uh, rating would actually be. So to talk about the standard fire resistance test for, for structural testing, 
Again, if we take a, a beam, and, and most, most of the times in uh, standard fire resistance tests, this beam will be unrestrained. We apply a load to it, and we get a bending moment. And this is a statically determinate system. So it's just a, a simple supported beam. The load we apply will obviously be less than the capacity of the beam, ultimately, at the ultimate limit state. Um, and this gives rise to the first important concept, concept in terms of fire resistance, and that is load factor. And the load factor is just the maximum moment applied to the beam divided by the capacity of the actual beam. So if we now apply a thermal regime in terms of overall rising temperature and a, a gradient across that beam, um, what actually happens to the beam is the beam starts to get hot. And as it starts to get hot, then the properties, if it's a steel beam, will start to degrade with temperature. So this is a view of the reduction in yield stress of a steel beam. And you can see that if, for, if, if we had a sort of normally designed beam that was quite efficiently designed, uh, the, the capacity at the fire limit state divided by its ultimate capacity would probably be in the region of around about 0.6. So you see that uh, by uh, the time that the beam has reached around about 550 degrees C, that that beam will have reduced in its capacity to something near to the load that be applied in the actual fire test. So M max equals M capacity. We will get a plastic hinge forming in the centre of that beam. As it's determinate, that means failure. And you get a massive increase in deflection and failure in that test. So the time it takes to get to that temperature is uh, an important part in terms of defining fire resistance. Obviously, if I had less load and less moment, then I could maybe go to a higher temperature before the capacity of that beam is actually breached. So really, that's just really out, outlining some of the, the, you know, the, the, the behavior of um, steel elements within um, standard fire resistance tests. So, in terms of, uh, so, uh, so in terms of the building regulations, what you would normally do is you would just need to apply enough fire protection to your steel element, steel element to make sure it met 120 minutes as tested by a product manufacturer in the testing house. So, so what are the alternative approaches? So the, the way we, uh, we like to look at it is in terms of individual component behavior and whole structural behavior, and there are various techniques which can be used to both of those uh, treating the structure as, uh, uh, like that in both ways. And then we can subject it to a standard fire, because that's what we're more familiar with, to get a, an artificial uh, fire resistance rating. Or we could maybe attempt to use things like parametric time temperature curve to assess how a natural fire would behave, uh, and therefore, can we look at that behavior? So the, these different approaches are all available to actually understand uh, the performance of structures in fire. So a structural fire engineering approach would normally compose of a number of sequential stages. And the first stage is just the characterization of the actual compartment. And a lot of this is outlined in BS 7974, which is a performance-based approach to, to, to fire engineering. And the, so characterization of the compartment in terms of the actual fire load that's there, in terms of the potential ventilation conditions, which may be there in terms of a severe fire, but also the thermal inertia of the compartment itself, because basically the, the, how hot the atmosphere gets is dependent on the ability of the structure to absorb heat as the fire actually develops. Uh, and there are various methods of actually calculating then how hot the atmosphere temperature would get in such a compartment. And then once we know the atmosphere temperature, we can then calculate the thermal response of the actual uh, structure. And then we can build some kind of model and apply that thermal response to that model to assess how it would behave structurally. So if you like, these three stages are the three important stages in terms of a performance-based design approach. And the way we, we like to look at this uh, in terms of the different methods is uh, on degree of complexity, because some of the methods are quite simple uh, to the most complicated, and obviously the degree of user knowledge required to actually uh, apply these techniques to, to real structures. So obviously the simple, simplest form itself is just a standard curve. And the standard curve that's used for testing, there are other standard curves. So for example, standard curves for hydrocarbon fires, standard curves for smoldering fires, which have been developed over the years, which could be applied to your structure in different circumstances to try and understand how those elements would behave either individually or as a framework. The most common one, and the one I'll probably spend a bit more time on later, is the parametric time temperature curve. 
This is now enshrined in the Euro Code, and it's been calibrated against the results of over 144 compartment fires uh, over the years, uh, and it's sort of well established now as a technique to actually estimate how hot an atmosphere temperature will get in, in a fire. More sophisticated uh, uh, still are zone models, and zone models actually uh, look at the propensity of a, of a compartment to actually go into flashover, so they'll consist of a hat a hot layer and a lower layer and try to estimate the degree of heat transfer between the two to see whether you get a post flash over fire. So it's a, it's a more sophisticated approach than the parametric time temperature curve. And then if we wanted to go really complicated we, and we wanted to look at the effect of localised fires on, on, on buildings, we could look, go to techniques like computational fluid dynamics where we could define a heat source and then see how the, the, the temperature would develop within the atmosphere. Uh, using that technique. And obviously that's quite a complicated technique. It, quite, it requires quite a lot of user knowledge uh, and um, skill to be able to apply that uh, to, to, to fires. So, so this, is, this is a view of a, of a parametric time temperature curve and just a couple of points really. Um, there's really sort of two types of fire we look at. Obviously one of the main unknowns in terms of most compartments is the actual ventilation conditions you're going to get. Obviously, it depends on where. So, if I've got a fully glazed facade, like a commercial office building, then obviously my opening factor in terms of the available ventilation coming from the outside of the building into the compartment can vary quite a lot because it's a fully glazed facade. Glazing fails at temperatures between 300 and 400 degrees C, which is uh, uh, way lower than the atmosphere temperature could be expected to get to. So, you were going to get some glazing failure, but it's what extent of the glazing failure you actually get. Uh, whereas if I had a residential construction with sort of fixed openings and then solid elements to the facade, my opening factor might be quite restricted. And the importance of opening factor can be seen here. Uh, so if I have a, a big opening factor, an opening factor of 0 0.08, another parametric time temperature curve, what I tend to get is what we call a short hot fire. So we get a fire which peaks within about 20 minutes at a quite a high atmosphere temperature because basically there's enough ventilation available to actually just burn all the consumables in that compartment very quickly. So what you get is a very short fire that rises quite quickly and then decays quite quickly. If I then stop the ventilation down so I can then control the flow of ventilation into that compartment, obviously now it takes a lot longer for a severe fire to actually develop. So what we get here is a fire which doesn't get as hot, uh, and this is typ typical office loading, uh, but it burns for a lot longer. Uh, and in terms of structural performance, if I'm going to look at the structural performance of a real frame in a fire, then I don't tend to know uh, what is going to be the worst case fire for that compartment. So it's important to consider a, a realistic range of ventilation conditions that can be applied to any fire compartment in assessing how hot it gets in a fire. The other thing that's important in terms of uh, fire and fire development is, is obviously the fire loading that could be potentially there. So this is a table uh, from uh, 7974 part 1, um, and in it, it defines the fractiles of loading in terms of megajoules per meter squared that could be expected. Uh, so the statistical distribution of fire load for different occupancies. So just really pointing out, we would normally design for the 80% fractile, which is recommended in, in 7974. Um, for offices, it's only 570. For shops, it could be as high as 900 because you don't actually know what would actually be in the shop. If it's a furniture store, then potentially there's a lot of fire loading in, in, in that occupation. And likewise in residential construction, uh, in dwellings, where the fire load is quite high. So it's important uh, when it comes to apply concepts like time equivalence um, that you understand the occupancy of the structure that you're actually applying it to. And just to talk a bit about time equivalence, what, what, what the concept of time equivalence is, uh, is, is taking the area under the expected design fire and then trying to relate that back to the standard, the, 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 the same amount of heating under the standard fire resistance curve um, so that you could actually specify a fire protection material. Most product manufacturers will only protect under the standard fire resistance curve. So therefore, they need to know and understand what kind of fi fire protection system do I need to apply to get to, to, to that. So here is a, a range of, uh, and obviously in terms of residential construction, what tends to happen is the module and compartment sizes tend to be a lot smaller, so they're more confined. 
So residential fires tend to result in a lot hotter fires than you would get in commercial offices, for example. Um, and then if I stop the ventilation down, then obviously I can quite easily get up to a, a, a you know, a, a, a equivalent fire resistance rating of up to about 100 minutes, which means I can't get it down any lower than 120 minutes. So time equivalence is something that sometimes you can see misapplied, particularly in fire engineering circles, uh, and they think it can be blanketly applied to any structure, but it's important that you understand exactly uh, what you're doing in terms of uh, fire development. Uh, now, obviously, I could talk a lot more about different uh, components in, in these different elements, but I obviously have got a, a limited amount of time to actually talk about this. So in terms of thermal response uh, methods, there are, there are methods which are, again, in the Euro codes, the material Euro codes. So for, in the Euro codes, for, for every material Euro code there is, we have an equivalent fire Euro code. So 1992-12 for concrete, 1993-12 for steel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in, the, in those codes, there are ways of actually calculating. I put down hand calculation. It's it probably a bit tedious by hand. It's normally a spreadsheet, but uh, what I'm trying to say is quite a simple method to apply and easily, easily codable in a spreadsheet. If we want to go a bit more sophisticated, and sometimes we have to because we have uh, constructional systems which are hybrid systems which consist of concrete and steel, uh, then we may need, need to move to finite analysis or finite difference methods, uh, which for thermal is, is quite a simple analysis within most of the actual codes. If we have to take into account interaction of atmosphere and structure and thermal response, then we may sometimes need to go to things like computational fluid dynamics. But that's a very rare um, uh, occurrence in terms of thermal response. So just to give you an example, this, this is just a spreadsheet calculation. And really, under both the standard curve and the parametric time temperature curve, we can readily calculate how hot a element may get. This, this is a steel element both unprotected and protected. So there are equations for unprotected and protected steelwork. And we can just apply them to understand how hot a steel member may actually get um, under, the, under a natural fire or a standard fire resistance curve. This is an example of a finite element type of approach um, where we've got, say, a slim deck beam embedded in a concrete slab. So now we've got properties of concrete and steel, which are obviously quite different thermally and the way they respond in terms of thermal inertia. So we want to calculate the temperature distribution within that kind of system. We have to move to things like finite element analysis. <coughs> That's all I want to say really about thermal response. Um, so now we move on to stru the structural fire engineering methods. Then within the material codes, there, there, are, there are quite simple concepts of looking at individual elements behaving uh, unrestrained on their own. And we can calculate limiting temperatures and moment capacity by moment capacity methods, the resistance, the, how, how a beam may behave given a certain fire loading and getting to a certain temperature. If we then start to move to things like whole, whole framework behavior, then we start to get methods which are sort of enshrined in the SCI uh, design guide, which was developed by Bailey, it's often called the Bailey method where we can actually look at membrane action and, and combinations of unprotected and protected steel elements to make an assessment of, uh, of, of how a, a, a floor plate may behave in fire. And then, last but not least, if we really want to understand how a structure behaves in fire, we've got to go to things like finite element analysis where we can capture things like the, the material degradation with temperature um, and that... Uh, different thermal regimes that can be applied to the structure, but also the more realistic restraint that takes place between individual elements acting within a framework. So this is really the only way that it can be captured. So when the research was embarked upon by British Steel all those years ago, they tried to get simple methods, but by the sort of developments within things like computers, we can now start to run these analyses uh, in, in terms of finite element uh, analysis to get a, a better understanding of how structures behave in fire. Uh, and in terms of developing an optimised fire protection system, or what I mean by an optimised fire protection system is that we're going to start to look at how real fi fires and real structures behave and apply the fire protection where it's required uh, for it to actually ensure that you get meet the functional requirements of the building regulations. So in terms of increasing economy solution, you have to move towards finite element methods to actually 
unlock that potential. And I'll come across that in terms of um, some of the case study that we, we will look at later. This is just really putting up uh, in terms of the, what, what I mean by limiting temperature and moment capacity approach, simple approaches, where we look at the development of the temperature within an element and at a certain stage calculate the stress strain state to understand what its moment capacity actually is. And then this is just a, a slide which just illustrates that the, the Bailey method is available if we want to ap apply it to um, uh, structures in fire. But it, what it's really, one of the limitations of it is it's limited to rectangular spans, normally brace frames. So if you've got that, then it's, it's quite a good method to actually apply. And basically what you can do is trade off some unprotected secondaries, usually with the enhancement of the mesh because it's looking at uh, the tensile membrane capacity of the mesh within the slab. So to, 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 to the first uh, uh, case study, um, and it's uh, the shard, which we've done so, some years ago now, but it's, it's a good illustration because um, in terms of the shard, I don't know if everybody knows about the shard, but it, basically it's, it's a tower but with this backpack attached to it, uh, which obviously generates a large composite floor plate. It's, it's a hybrid structure in that the material changes through the height of the structure. So the basement is in concrete. The first 41 levels, which are mainly uh, commercial office, are, are traditional composite steel. And then we change the structural system to reinforce concrete in the hotel and resi areas, mainly to save uh, floor to floor height with that construction system. Uh, and then the spire at the top uh, changes back to steel. So obviously it's a hybrid structure and it's got different uh, structural materials within it. To try and get that building functioning, there's various transfers in terms of columns transfers in, 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 that, in that structure, um, which is not atypical of a, of a, of a high-rise building. But then also we've got all these different, it's a mixed-use development, so we've got all these different occupancies. So in terms of applying a structural fire engineering approach to that building, we have to consider a number of occupancies, a number of structural types, and understand how that building would actually behave in fire. So where most of the concentration tends to be in composite steel frame building is developing optimised fire protection systems, that system. And so it's, it's a question of taking a, a systematic approach to how you would assess that building. And the systematic approach would consist of really, first of all, identifying the different elements of structure and what their function was in that building in terms of vertical and lateral stability. And then concentrating on those parts of the building where you can uh, generate some savings in terms of fire protection costs. Obviously the floor plates vary in size, so we would take a, a, a number of uh, typical floors, mostly to, around the different differences in the framing arrangements, because obviously it's a sloping uh, structure, so it changes as it goes up. Uh, we would decide on the worst case fire, so a short hot fire and a long cool fire, so we would consider a, a range of ventilation conditions. We would use the office fire loading, which is quite low, which gives an opportunity to generate some savings that way, develop FE models, analyse and assess, and then most importantly, assess sensitivity. So instead of, uh, what we would design to the 80% fractile fire loading, but we'd also assess sensitivity under 90% fractile loading to make sure we don't have things like a, a cliff edge event. So in terms of what an optimised structural fire protection scheme would look like, um, most of the protective beams shown there in red uh, are the beams which actually join between columns. And the reason why we, we, we're keen on uh, protecting beams between columns is because the beams provide stability to the actual columns on a floor by floor basis. So they were protected to 90 minutes, but the secondary beams in between, we could leave unprotected. So, so this is the, the development of this is the optimised fire protection scheme we developed. You may see that some bays are, are completely filled in red, and the reason for that is that one of the important things in terms of uh, tall builders, in particular, is the maintenance of compartmentation floor to floor. So the evacuation strategy for the building and most commercial office buildings rely on phased evacuation. So if there were fire starting on a on a fire floor, you would evacuate that floor and the floor above it and then progressively fa phased evac evacuate the rest of the occupants from the building up on the floors above the actual fire. So obviously maintenance and compartmentation, keeping the fire on that floor is the most important thing. So the, the weak points generally in framing arrangements like this tend to be around the service risers. And what we, what we like to do at WSP in particular is 
keep the surface risers outside of the core. And the reason for that is so we don't have penetration through the core, so that it's easier structurally to design those core walls. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we protect the steel elements supporting that compartmentation around the service risers. So it's not a blanket rule that you can just leave fire protection off all the secondary beams within the bay. You have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And what we tend to be looking at in terms of the floor plates, again, is keeping strains within that floor plate down to a level where you're not likely to get an integrity failure. So we're not talking about the level of deflection that you're getting in the Carlington fire test where the steelwork was completely unprotected. This is an optimised scheme where we're selectively applying the fire protection to give us a certain performance for the floor plate in fire. One, one of the most important things, if I was doing the time equivalent analysis on this and doing the office fire loading, and then I might, I might assume that I get a 90-minute fire resistance system might be blankly applied to all elements. But an important thing to understand about performance of, 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 of these floor plates in fire is that what actually happens when the floor plate starts to expand is it tends to expand away from the core. The core is a very stiff element. So in terms of thermal expansion, the only place that the steel floor plate has got to go is outwards. And what this tends to do is start to induce bending in the column. And what that does is if I apply a 90-minute uh, fire protection system to the column, it means that that column can sometimes prematurely surely, um, fail under a combination of axial uh, force and bending induced by the fire. So this, this is really why on Shard we went for 120-minute columns and 90-minute beams. So this is the start of, if you like, trying to identify critical elements of structure and that may sort of fire protect critical elements of structure to a higher level than I would get um, uh, with, with him. So, and then this type of behaviour was observed in the Carlison fire test. So th this is the actual strain distribution in this column in test three, shown on the bottom. Uh, and that beam, unprotected beam, expands. As it expands, you can see it pushes the column out and induces a bending moment. Uh, so this is, this, this is the strain in the... In the, in, the, in the front and back flange of, that, of the actual column. Uh, and then obviously once the, the beam reaches a temperature where it can no longer sustain an axial load pushing the column out, it then recovers. Uh, but obviously what you've got to realise is that in an optimised scheme, we will have that, that beam will be fire protected. And because it's fire protected, it will continue to push the column out for longer. So that's the kind of thing we need to uh, look at when we're actually developing an optimised fire protection scheme. Another critical area where which we looked at on shard was the transfer structures. Um, and the important thing about um, transfer structures is they tend to be self-restraining structures. If you have a column, most columns when heated would just push the floor plate up because transversely the floor plate is not so stiff. So when it expands, the column will just uh, push, the, push the column up and it won't induce any extra load in the column. Uh, so it's straightforward material degradation or combination of material regulation and bending, which actually governs that. But transfer structures and brace structures are not like that. They tend to be self-restraining. So, and this is the type of transfer structure we're looking at. Now, obviously, that kind of element within a structural frame can be, is a really critical element of structure, particularly for vertical stability, because if that fails, then the whole, the whole of the column above that comes down with it. And we obviously, we don't want that to happen. So on, on Shard, we developed like 3D models which had the realistic restraint of the surrounding structure. And what we did was we applied just uniform temperature load to those uh, elements to see at what temperature they would actually start to fail at. So the, the, the graph on the bottom has two things on it. The first is the increase in axial force. So you can see at the start of the graph um, that there's a certain axial force in the column, which will be there at the fire limit state. And then as we start to apply temperature, the forces in those bracing elements start to increase. So they increase in terms of compressive behaviour because they're, both those braces are restraining each other from actually getting into the state they want to get to from free thermal expansion. So and, then, so and then the dotted line is the vertical deflection. So you can see that the bracing system itself is pushing the column up at the top. Uh, but what happens when, it, when the force increases to a level where, and, and obviously as the temperature increases, the material is also degrading, so you get this crossover point where you get an increase in temperature and a degradation in capacity, 
So there'll be a crossover point where that bracing system then starts to come down. So, restrict, so transfer systems themselves are completely different elements in terms of the way that we treat them for the in a structural fire engineering case. And we ended up protecting those elements to uh, achieve a limiting temperature of 500 degrees C under a natural fire curve that could be expected on that fly plate, the, the, the range of natural fire curves. And we ended up protecting those elements for two hours as well as the columns. This is a different approach again, which is mainly based upon thermal analysis and um, uh, moment capacity calculation. So uh, there used to be a part of the, the, really the local regulations called Section 20 in London. And, and part of that was a requirement that in terms of changes of compartmentation, there needed to be two hours uh, fire resistance in terms of compartmentation between those different occupancies. Because uh, we, we, we specified an optimized scheme they then asked us to demonstrate that it would have 120 minutes fire resistance. So by applying the standard fire curve, doing a thermal analysis, and doing a moment capacity calculation, it was possible to show that, that those beams would provide 120 minutes fire resistance, which really goes to show the amount of redundancy that is there when you start to look at how structures behave. So this is the redundancy we're taking advantage of, which was seen in things like the Broadgate fire right at the actual beginning. So, 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 so this is just another technique we can use to un understand how certain elements will behave in fire. We were also asked to look at concrete spalling. Now, concrete as a material is, is, is considered to be far better in fire than steel. Um, and, and generally it is, and, it, and generally why it is, is because of its much higher thermal inertia. So basically it takes a lot longer for a concrete element to heat up than it does a steel element. So, so, so concrete all traditionally thought as being good in fire. Um, but the, the problem of spalling, particularly as we move towards high strength concretes, has come to the fore um, in, in terms of, you know, can we do something to mitigate the, the, the you know, instances of spalling? Uh, because the problem with spalling is because we, it, reduces, it reduces the cover to reinforcement, which means you can lose the, fire, the inherent fire resistance you have in most concrete structures. Um, BRE do have an qualitative assistant uh, a method which we used here to try and uh, you know, determine the elements which were at risk from spalling and then we could apply polypropylene fibres to those elements to make sure that that risk was mitigated. So again, a different technique, different approach, but it all comes from understanding of how structures behave in fire. And then last not, but not least, um, Again, looking at concrete structures, just to give a bit of variety. Um, what, what, one area where we, sometimes people have difficulty meeting the fire resistance ratings in the tabular approach to the Euro code for concrete is the things like blade columns. And most engineers sort of get confused because in the actual structural part of the concrete Euro code, they define the difference between a column and a wall as an aspect ratio of four to one. Yeah. And then if you look at the fire uh, part of, this, of the concrete Euro code. There are a series of tables defining how columns or walls can actually perform in fire. But the, the, where the confusion tends to arise, it's not that aspect ratio that's important in terms of performance in fire. It's more to do with the actual exposure that that element could actually be subject to. Because most walls, they assume, are only heated from one side. And therefore, all the tables within the, stru the structural Euro code for concrete are based upon exposure from one side. But if we have a blade column, which has an aspect ratio greater than four to one, some engineers say, oh, it's got an aspect ratio greater than four to one, it's a wall, I can just use those tables. But you can't really, you've got to go back to the tables for the columns. So if you want to do something a bit more sophisticated, what you can actually do is subject that concrete element to four-sided exposure under the standard fire curve, calculate the isotherms, and then calculate the capacity of the section using the method in the Euro code to show that that blade column would have satisfactory performance in fire. And, and some developers like the flexibility of that because they don't always know sometimes these concrete blade walls they tend to go for blade columns because they need to be embedded in walls to keep the thickness of the wall down. And they don't always know if that's always going to be there. Like, you know, so it gives them the flexibility in terms of reuse later. Another area where we sometimes have to go to a performance-based approach is in the assessment of existing structures. So increasingly these days we're, we're getting, being asked to look at the fire resistance of traditional construction. So this is just an example of a, 
a concrete and pot floor system where to show what the inherent fire resistance of that system would be, you would have to do some kind of thermal analysis and then some kind of moment capacity calculation to actually um, uh, assess what the fire resistance rating would be. So to conclude, real structural behaviour in fire is quite complex and that's why we need, do need sophisticated tools to actually assess in, if we want to take advantage of optimised fire protection systems. And by adopting the performance-based design approach, we can tend to get more economical designs compared to simple approaches. So we apply the fire protection where it's required. So we apply it to critical elements of structure, whereas we can leave less critical uh, elements of structure, maybe even unprotected or with a reduced fire resistance rating. It's more suitable for innovative and complex buildings, obviously. So we're not doing this day in, day out. Uh, if it's a, a small steel frame building somewhere, the analysis required to, to show that it works is probably not worth it in terms of the saving of the fire protection you could actually achieve. It does give us a better understanding of actual structural behaviour in fire. So you wouldn't necessarily pick up the things like the bikes you're bending in the column um, you know, if, by using a less sophisticated approach. You only get it by actually understanding how a floor plate would actually behave in fire. And obviously, we definitely need to apply it to more critical parts of structure to make sure we've got the right level of fire resistance so we can maintain that stability and meet the functional requirements of the building regulations. And really, that needs to be undertaken by somebody who understands both structural performance and fire. So really, structural engineers need to get more involved in understanding how structures may behave in fire so you can actually apply some of these techniques to your actual structures. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. Just let me know if you're answering questions, yeah? So if anybody would like to ask any questions, please raise your hand. Can you just wait for the microphone to come down? Mark, thank you very much for that. It was very interesting. Um, a quick question for you on the shard. Um, on the composite floors, if you had finished your analysis at the simple component, individual component-based style analysis and not moved on and done a full system FE analysis, um, how much saving would you have missed out on? Because clearly you managed to, to remove fire protection from the secondaries there. Yeah. But I, mean, I, mean, I mean, roughly, um, I mean... If you did a blanket approach of, say, natural fire, this, I mean, shard, it depends on the fire protection method, yeah? And where the biggest savings are is if you've got off-site intumescent, because off-site intumescent tends to be uh, more than on-site intumescent and obviously more than more, the more traditional passive fire protection materials. So in terms of the shard, um, if you applied the 120 minutes, which was the prescriptive, if you start off with that, that as your benchmark, if you went to a 90-minute system for the, the, the cost of on-site uh, off-site intumescent at the time, that would have been a 50% saving in fire protection cost. And then by adopting the optimised approach, that was a 50% saving on that. So if you like, 25% of what you would have applied to the floor plate. Uh, now, obviously, we applied fire protection 120 minutes, which is a traditional to the columns, the transfer structures, etc. So that was sort of cost neutral. But on the floor plates themselves, it, it was 25% of the cost. Lovely, thank you. Next question. Uh, thanks, Mark, that was really good. Um, not a question, I'd just like to reinforce your point, really. It, we do a lot of steel st structures, and we find that if you do the prescriptive method, the savings are in the order of what you're talking about there, but there are practical ramifications. So we might not be able to provide an off-site solution to a lot of the lighter steel weight members. So our message as a steelwork fabricator providing off-site off solutions is to always pursue the, the, off, the fire engineered method rather than the prescriptive, because not only are you coming up with heavy DFT thicknesses on the steel, you're adding a lot of mass to the structure as well. And it's a, double-edged sword really, it yeah. can hit you twice, so. Yeah. 
I mean, obviously, if an element is unprotected, then it obviously doesn't need any fire protection anyway, so that's, that's an immediate saving. But uh, one of the things we do, uh, and, and we try to get into our engineers, basically at the concept stage, is do not go too light on webs, particularly on fabricated sections. And also, don't go mad in terms of providing uh, too big a holes in the actual webs of the beams and having them too close together. So if we can, we sort of try and, if it's, particularly if it's a multi-dis approach, we try and educate our MEP engineers to live with a, a few less holes which are more widely spaced apart. And by doing that, you can head off a lot of the problems with fire protection when it comes to actually applying it. Next question. Uh, uh, about shard, I'm wondering what kind of failure criteria you used, uh, except the moment capacity and the deflection. So I guess for such analysis, you need to assess the local uh, failure and global failure. So such as for deflection, what kind of failure criteria you used? Yeah, um, we, we don't tend to concentrate on deflection. Say what we tend to look at is things like strains in slabs, because it's the integrity of the slab that's important. And we try and keep within uh, levels of deflection and strains that we have seen in testing, so that we don't try and push the system too far. So, and then obviously, when we come to when we've done this type of analysis, uh, this analysis is not normally assessed by building control. It gets sent out for third party review. So the shard was no exception, and all our our procedures and our assessment methods get sent out and is reviewed by a third party before it's accepted by building control. So um, we adopt what we think are sensible acceptance criteria, but it tends to be on strain rather than deflection. So the, but the deflections we got in the systems on, on shard were probably less than span over 20, which most people would take as an acceptance criteria because that's the most common one used in the standard testing. But that standard testing yeah. criteria is set to actually re restrict damage to test furnaces rather than being an actual structural failure. So sometimes we get into that, sometimes we have had systems where we go to say span over 15 with deflections, particularly if it's a longer span solution. Yeah. So therefore then we get into a debate with building control over what is a sensible criteria to actually use for, for that particular structure. But it really has to be assessed on a case by case basis. Yeah, because the as you said, um, the uh, the span over 20 is more like for from the furnace test yeah. and uh, for short beam. So basically not that useful for such a shard. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite complicated to uh, define failure criteria yeah. for such a complicated yeah. case. It, it also depends, the Re reason why we like to concentrate on strain is because it depends, a lot of it depends on aspect ratio of the actual bay you're actually protecting. And the square of that bay can be the better because what you do is, uh, I mean, when the floor plate's expanding, it's expanding in, in two directions, not one direction. So actual, when we do our analysis, a, a fully protected scheme can sometimes take longer to converge than a, due to the cracking in the slab because because basically, if you've got uh, say 15 meter beams at three meter spacings, that that floor plate wants to deflect across the beams. And that can actually cause far more cracking in the slab than if you actually let it deflect thermally. So you've got equalization of the combination of the thermal expansion of the slab line. Up. So it is quite complicated. These are just observations we make when we undertake these type of analyses. Like that. So deflection isn't normally the, the only criteria we would use to, to, to judge how, how well an optimized fire protection scheme would perform. Yeah, sorry. And the last one is, uh, so, uh, did you use the standard fire curve for shard and uniform applied? We, it depends on what you're actually trying to prove. Sometimes we would use a standard fire curve just because it's, it's easier to actually sort of build a controller more comfortable with a standard fire curve in that they, they think there's a, a testing background to it and they understand it a lot more. Um, so sometimes we will use that and we sometimes use that when it's difficult to characterize the fire loading. So for things like the office floor plates, then we can characterize as a, the, the fire loading. But in areas like plant areas, 
then it's a lot more difficult to do that. And so sometimes it's just easier to adopt the standard fire resistance curve to demonstrate what the sort of equivalent performance would be of the structural system under that curve. I mean. So it depends really on what the area and what the occupancy is. Thank you very much. My question is, how vulnerable are bolted connections, especially during the fire when you have a high rotation, you know, and, and have you noticed any sharing of bolts during the fire, or yeah, the especially non-composite beam? Yeah, um, well, well, I mean, if it was a non-composite beam, we would be fully protecting that steel frame framework. That's, that's for starters, and that would include the connection area. But in, in terms of connection performance, particularly if you look at what the connection performance in shard, then obviously certain types of connection are more vulnerable in fire than others. And obviously thin plate connections are not particularly good in fire because the bolts just shear. But the most critical time for connections is not actually in the heating phase, it's actually in the cooling phase. So you can imagine that the beam, when, when, when the beam's expanding, the connection's being pushed back into the column. And because it's being pushed back into the column, it's mainly under compression. And therefore, the failure of a connection could be quite rare on the, in the heating phase of the fire. But when the fire then starts to cool down, obviously what's happening is you get some degree of plastic straining, particularly at the ends of the beams. And when the, then the beam starts to cool down and starts to regain strength and stiffness, then obviously what that's trying to do is trying to stretch a beam which has been shortened back into the the span that it is, and obviously that creates huge tension forces. So normally the, criti the critical phase for connections is actually in cooling down. So it doesn't tend to be a life safety issue because um, obviously most people will be out the building uh, when the cooling phase of the fire takes place, but obviously you want to limit and have good connection performance in fire, and certain connections are definitely better. So things, things like header plates are far better in fire than... Um, in place because they're not brittle failures. So basically, the more ductility you can get in there, the better. The same as progressive collapse, really. The same sort of um, rules sort of apply. Um, you mentioned how um, members would expand against the core and push against the beams or push upwards. On other projects, do you think there might be scope for um, connection details that allow movement so that that's less of a problem, potentially? So you mean like slotted connections? You, you, uh. could, you, could, you, you, I mean, you could you could do that. Uh, obviously, it depends on the fabrication, whether he likes to do that. Yeah. Um, but again, and also it adds a lot more flexibility because obviously what you're relying on is the, the floor plate acting as a diaphragm to transfer things like wind loads back into the core uh, for the normal static design. So we're not just considering the fire design, we've also got to consider the normal static design as well. Right? And also it depends what it would do in terms of diaphragm action within the floor plate, which is obviously assumed to transfer the main, the main loads into the core anyway. Right? No. So, so feasibly, yes. I don't see it practically being done, though, um, in most, most circumstances. 